Welcome to the Love of the Star podcast. I'm Bobby Bell, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 through the fan in Dallas. Joined as always by former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broadus. He is now the co host of the G Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 through the fan of Dallas. He's also the pre and post game co host on the Dallas Cowboys radio network. And uh, he's also the co host of the DallasCowboys.com draft show, which you see on his, uh, his little polo there. And something that if you're watching on the YouTube, you'll see that. And uh, we'll have a lot to say. I think about the draft in the coming weeks and probably here in the coming minutes as we talk about some of the developments yeah. coming out of Indianapolis and where things stand with the Cowboys and their active roster and some future players. But before we jump into that, Brian, how you doing? Doing well, Robert. I've missed you. Um, oh, I missed you too. I had a lot of FOMO about not being at the Combine, but I was hanging out with a World Championship baseball team for the week, and that was very nice, but... Man, my attention was looking to what was going on in Indianapolis and what was happening with workouts and late night, uh, late night cocktails and uh, steak and shake at four in the morning and all those <laughs> things that I that I used to do. So, uh, yeah, hopefully next year we get back on that. But, yeah, a lot, lot coming out, a lot coming out of the, uh, the combine. Absolutely. You, and believe it or not. Yeah, and and uh, let, let's go ahead and take a uh, tackle some of these topics that came out of the combine for the Cowboys specifically. I think the big headline, the report that's been out there is Ian Rappaport's note from NFL Network that Tyron Smith has likely played his final game in a Dallas Cowboys uniform. The Cowboys and his agent met uh, at the combine on Friday, I believe it was. And after that meeting is when it came out that, hey, there's just too large of a gap here. He will go into free agency and the Cowboys will figure things out from there. Uh, so, Brian, just uh, first off, are you assuming that this report is correct and this is the direction that things are heading? Um, are you surprised that Tyron Smith is ultimately going to play somewhere else? Are you surprised the Cowboys didn't push more to get something done? Or do you think it's just, hey, this is ultimately where this was going to end. There was going to reach a breaking point where Tyron wanted a certain amount of guarantees and the Cowboys were going to say, well, we can't do that because of your injury history. No, absolutely. That's the final one. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that Tyron Smith does come back. Uh, you know, it will, if it turns into him going to get more money, he won't be back. If he's chasing a ring, he might not be back. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with Dallas and, you know, going forward and, you know, where we feel like that their chances of getting a ring are. It's been, you know, pretty pretty bleak here the last several years when it comes to, you know, playoff success. But if he's chasing money, they can't match it. If he's chasing a ring, we'll see. But, yeah, there has been a lot of uh, – for a long time, Tyron Smith had given the Cowboys a break on his contract. Yeah. And he played at a very, very high level. The problem is – he is availability is not always there. You know, three games, four games, two games, that kind of thing is what we've seen. Played 13 last year. Um, played a very, very high level. Uh, and so he's probably looking at this as like, listen, I don't want to go through another one of these pay for play type situations. And you know what? Don't blame him. Don't blame the Cowboys. Uh, you know, there's a couple of different ways they can go and, We'll probably talk about those here on this show. So uh, let's let's take a look at the internal option first. Um, yeah. It's funny. They had talked about Tyler Smith in the days leading up to the Tyron Smith reports. And Stephen Jones was talking as if it sounded like they were, they were more inclined to leave Tyler Smith at left guard uh, than tackle, which is a shift. Typically, whenever they've talked about Tyler, whenever you guys have interviewed him on the G-Bag Nation on 105, um, Steven has always said, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, you know, his future's at left tackle, or oh, yeah, we still view his future there at left tackle. This was the first time that he kind of softened it and said, well, you know, maybe he's a little like Larry Allen, where he can uh, he can do whatever you ask him to, but man, what, a, what an incredible guard there. And, and so it sounded like they were inferring Tyler Smith's future at guard. Do you think when that statement was made, it was made with the assumption to them that they were going to be able to work something out with Tyron Smith. Yes. And that, and so if Tyron's gone yes. now, do you think that changes yes. things for them? Yes, I do. And uh, this is a very, very deep draft. 
uh, when we sit down and talk about it, about the offensive tackles, how far it could stretch. Uh, potentially at 24, they can absolutely grab an offensive tackle. And I think a pretty good one at that point. Um, would it be the most ideal thing? To me, the most ideal thing for the Dallas Cowboys would be to move Tyler Smith to left tackle, play T.J. Bass at left guard, and then draft a center. That would be, I think, the best way of fixing this. But they've done a great job with first-round offensive linemen, plug-and-play guys. Um, I don't doubt that they won't do the same thing. If they want to keep Tyler Smith at left guard, then now the left tackle is clearly in play here for this football team. What do, you, what do you think about, just personally for yourself, Tyler Smith's future? Because I've looked at him, and, man, I, I thought he was so impressive last year with the, the way that he grew. And and I think when people look at the way he played last year, they're like, well, look, he was an all-pro at guard. Why would you move him off that? We saw things were you know good, but they weren't necessarily dominant at tackle. So clearly, you got to keep him at guard. And to me, it's like very young player who's still coming into his own. I think what you're seeing there is the leap of a second-year player more than just he's a guard instead of a tackle. But to me, I, I felt like Tyler Smith has the skill set to be a really, really good left tackle and, and to be one of the top left tackles in the game and and be one of the top guards in the game if that's where they choose to play him. But I, I think the growth that we've seen there is encouraging wherever it is that you choose to play him. But, Brian, if you could – let's say you could get an equally good player – at whatever spot you left vacated by Tyler Smith. So if you play Tyler Smith at left guard, you're going to get a league average left tackle. If you play Tyler Smith at left tackle, you're getting a league average left guard. Where would you prefer to play Tyler Smith in terms of just his ability and what you think he can be? I've seen him play both. Saw him as a rookie play left tackle and uh, didn't disappoint me there. Uh, seen him play a sophomore season as a left guard. Really didn't disappoint me there. I kind of feel like that his best position is probably guard, and, and you know the way that you know the way that um, I feel like that anything to do with power and to be able to hold up inside, um, I think that's his strength. I think his he he wants to play. I think with more power than he does finesse, and when you play tackle, you deal with a lot of finesse out there. And I think he's better equipped to play against guys that, that have power that don't move as quick, uh, played a high level at, at tackle. Don't, you know, don't, I'm not trying to discount what he did out there. I just think that, I mean, he, when he, when he plays inside in that small area where it's kind of confined, I think that's a better, better thing for him. Not saying he's a bad offensive tackle when it comes to, lateral slide or depth of set or punch or any of that stuff. I just think he's better equipped when it's just that one-on-one -on -one battle inside and it doesn't turn into guys capturing the edge or guys working him outside and coming back inside. I, I think he has a really good feel for how to handle these bigger and better uh, defensive tackles in this division that he's faced. And uh, I think I would leave him there if it was me. Now, one of the other things that we're we're starting to hear some chatter about coming out of Indianapolis, just based off public comments from the Cowboys and some of the reporting of, you know, really plugged in reporters like uh, Michael Gelkin at the Dallas Morning News is, and, and man, I feel like we're, we, we just keep seesawing a little bit. And maybe this is exactly what the Cowboys want to portray. But, but it feels like every other week we're kind of shifting the tone of, oh, yeah, they're going to get something done with Dak relatively quick. And then, oh, no, nope, they're, they're going to let this ride out. They're going to let him ride it out. And, and it just kind of seems to be flipping. Right now, coming out of Indy, the most recent feel coming out of there seems to be they're going to let it, they're, they're inclined to let it just run. And they reported, uh, the report was out there from Michael Gelkin that Mike Zimmer got a one-year deal. Yeah. Uh, the assistants got one-year deals. We know yeah. Mike McCarthy's on one. Yep. Do you think the Cowboys are setting this up based on everything we're hearing? Are the Cowboys setting this up for everybody is playing for their job? And if we get to the end of this and it's not any better, this is getting blown up. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think, though, Bobby, and I said this on our show on the G Bag Nation today, uh, as we taped this on a Monday evening, I don't think the Cowboys are ever going to be bad. 
And I say it in this way. As long as you let them draft, which I know it was a struggle last year, but they have a history of drafting well. And you let these guys have picks. You let Alex Loomis and those guys, Henry Schroka, in the pro department evaluate free agents down the line that they could pick up, whether it's a Brandon Cooks or Stephon Gilmore or, you know, uh, you know, Turpin or a kicker or whoever. Yeah. They've shown they can go out and get players that can play at a very, very high level. I don't think this team will ever be bad. I think it will always be at worst, it will be a nine and eight team. That's just that's just how I feel about it. Now we'll see what happens with you know with Dak Prescott's situation. You know, and maybe maybe it'll be where this turns into a Trey Lance team at some point in time. But I, I just don't see this team ever being four and thirteen. I unless something happens at quarterback, the this this personnel department will find players. And they might find cheap players. Uh, they might find you know guys that are really good fits that their coaches like. So I don't ever see this team being that bad, you know. And, and and you know they could have down years, but look at this division though too, you know Philadelphia. If you I I, I challenge Kellen Moore, and, and I don't know if that quarterback is exactly what Kellen Moore, the kind of offense that he wants to run. If that quarterback can do exactly what Kellen Moore wants to do with the type yeah. of routes that he throws. I don't know if he can. So Philadelphia could be a down year for them. Commanders, we feel like, though, that are, you know, maybe a quarterback away. But defensively, they were god-awful, you know. So they have a ways to go. The Giants, I mean, those guys are guys are talking about trading up in the draft to get a quarterback. They see the writing on the wall. Yeah. This might be the last campaign for them. This division might not be great. You know, and can Dallas win the division at ten and seven or something like that? Sure, but I, I don't ever see this football team being bad. I see them being five hundred. Don't see them being bad. A lot of different things to answer. Uh, we'll hopefully get a few do of those you, things. Do you answered. see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Or yeah. Does it no, make yeah. sense that way to you? Because yeah. I, I, I trust, I trust Will McClay and. And Alex Loomis and and Henry Schroka and scouts over there. I trust yeah. those guys. I know it was a bad campaign, and we'll see what happens with Mozzie Smith and those guys. Schoonmaker. We'll see what happens. But but I, they'll always keep them competitive. They'll always be competitive. They, they will not. This will not be a four and thirteen team unless the quarterback play is just awful. Yeah, you would you would have to get like a few devastating season ending injuries yeah. for, for things to turn like that, because they're always going to replenish the, the depth and, and find you players. They've consistently shown we'll go get you. And I know it, that things are changing and, you know, you may end up swapping some different guys out and, and they haven't gone the way you thought, but we'll go get you a starting fourth round center in Tyler Biotish. We'll get yeah. you a fourth round running back in Tony Pollard. We'll get mm -hmm. you an all pro corner in the fifth round in Deron Bland. We'll get you a, a strong starting corner for the better part of six, seven years in the sixth round in Anthony Brown. We'll, we'll find these guys for you. We'll go get you Cavante Turpin and Brandon Aubrey yeah. off the street. And so they, oh, they've no, we'll, shown we'll sign, we'll sign Ron, uh, we'll sign Ron Leary. Terrence Steele, a, a undrafted free agent. Terrence Steele didn't Steel. have a great year yeah. last year, but that's they an undrafted will, free agent who got a big contract. Go, they will go and find they will go and find players. That is the one thing that they can do. This isn't the Atlanta Falcons or the Arizona Cardinals or the Carolina Panthers. You know, this this team does a really good job of evaluating players and bring them in. Now, the problem is are those players good enough to win playoff games? That's and, something that hasn't happened. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, you're, you're going to have to answer. Can you find those guys to get you over the hump? And a lot of people would say the person to get you over the hump has to be the quarterback. So until you yeah. improve that quarterback, and, and that's something, look, I think Dak can win a Super Bowl, but that's what a lot of people are going to say is that, look, there reaches a point where you've, you've got to make it happen, and if you don't, you have to move on. And so that's something the Cowboys are probably wrestling with right now and something we will be getting answers on in the very near future. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast, the Love of the Stars and Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts.
All right, Brian, I am now going to take you into your favorite world, and that is the world of the NFL scouting combine and the NFL draft. We just talked about some of the things facing the Cowboys and and some of the things that they're they're going to look to replenish uh, here during this draft season. Uh, but before we you know uh, talk too much or, or figure out too much about what's going to happen in terms of with Tyron Smith and Dak Prescott and everything else, we did get the the NFL scouting combine where the Cowboys met with a number of different players. We we saw some big headline grabbing stuff like Xavier Worthy breaking the 40 yard dash record. Um different notes like uh you know the the top quarterbacks just choosing kind of to to be a little hands off at this and and not participate very much. Um and, and does that start a new trend? Uh I think I'd seen something that said over 200 of the the participants at the combine this year chose not to do the agility drills yeah. at the combine, which is absolutely nuts. And so Caleb Williams making headlines, deciding not to do his medicals out there. That's, uh, I believe, a first. Um, but Brian, kind of just your your general takeaways from from the combine, guys that maybe impressed you, guys that you think their stock has increased, or maybe you think, man. The way that testing looked, I'm going to have to go back and, and look a little closer at that guy. Or, man, uh, maybe I've cooled on somebody because that is not the way I expected them to test. Well, I'll say this the first off, and I appreciate everybody out there that, that follows along on our show. And then when we talk about players, and then you and I do the draft show on DallasCowboys.com. Yep. And that's one of my favorite shows I've, I've ever done. I love the draft show with all my heart because of where we've taken it. And I just want to remind people, if you're a guy or gal out there that likes to dabble in the drafting and say you watch players on YouTube or however you're getting your players, however you're watching this, you know, and you want to have an idea, you're like, man, I kind of like this guy better than this guy and all that. You know what? You're probably right. Your first thought about your player is probably right. Yep. And so be really careful as you digest the combine that you don't let the combine influence you in a way of like, well, I got to just push that guy way up the board. I got to drop this guy way down the board and all that. You know, your first evaluation is usually the right evaluation. And I know me personally, I'm a big fan of the, the tape. However you get it, I'm a big fan of that. And if I see a guy playing well, I'm, I'm generally going to put the guy where he needs to be, where I think sure. he needs to be. And I think teams are that way too. You know, we become enamored. There was a time when this thing wasn't televised, you know, and we were as scouts sitting there kind of like, okay, numbers, numbers, numbers. Okay. That translates, that translates, man, that guy's playing a lot faster. That guy's playing a lot slower. You know, you used to take the combine and do it that way. I just encourage folks to just keep your first thought as your best thought. And then if you have to circle back and circle back and look at a player and say, wait a minute, okay, I see the explosiveness here. I see the quickness here. Oh, wait, he doesn't finish very well. You know, you could watch Blake Corum play at Michigan and you watch him run and he runs four, five, three at the combine. Or, you know, four in the four or five, high four. Yeah, five. it was four, five, two, I believe. Yeah. So four, five, three, four, five, two. Yeah. So all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, you don't see the four, three or the four, four. And now you can say, okay, Blake Corum doesn't have any extended speed. You can translate that way is what you can do. And so I, I encourage folks, you know, combine, very important. The most important thing for me about the combine was are the physicals. And I I don't like the trend that Caleb Williams has done here. Or I shouldn't say a trend because he's the first one. The to president, do it. I, potentially. Yeah, the president of that. I don't like this because there was a time in the early 90s when I started that I could go to a school, USC, and I could get medical information. I could talk to the trainers and you know, I could, players could sign off and give me all the information, you know, the packet, you know, trainers would give you a, a packet and here's the guy's injury history. And you would kind of know about it going in well, Yeah. now because of HIPAA laws and all that, I don't get that. The combine for me is about, I need that medical information about you though. I need that 
to help me with my decision. What Caleb Williams is doing, and if Caleb Williams takes a 30 visit to Chicago Bears and then does his, does his visit there, gets a physical and all that, and then cancels everything else, you know your story. Chicago Bears are going to pick Caleb. They're going to trade Justin Fields. Caleb Williams is going to be the first overall pick, and here we go. If I'm sitting in the five hole or the six hole and I need a quarterback, I'm thinking about trying to bring Caleb Williams in because I might trade up. You know, yeah. How could I draft a guy that I don't have the medical information on? That, that would be very, very, very hard for me to do. See, this is where I get robbed a little bit. If I'm, if I'm one of these teams like the Giants, you know, maybe the Giants don't trade all the way up the board. Maybe they do. Maybe they feel desperate enough to go up and give Chicago what they want to get that pick. But I don't have a medical on Caleb Williams while I'm doing this. Yeah. Maybe I'm making a big deal about it, but this to me, that's the troubling part about it. You know, now if I bring him in on the 30 visit, I don't get to really spend time with him. Now, part of my day is spent trying to get him a physical, trying to get him in the MRI tube, trying to get him to all the specialists that need to see him. You know, you know, it's, this isn't just, okay, turn your head and cough. You right. Know? This is, this is something you know, we found injuries through the combine. We found fractured foots, fractured backs, heart like, issues, heart issues. We found all these things because of the Indy combine. And now, you know, if, 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 again, if Caleb Williams, he's setting himself up to like, if team, what the set, what, you know, what the commanders want to visit with him. Was he going to say no to the commanders? You know, what if the Patriots want to visit with him? He's going to say no to the Patriots. Yeah. Every place he's going now, he's going to have to get a physical. Every one of those places where he could have just knocked it out, you know, and then, and all of a sudden now we're all, you know, and I, I, I get it. Maybe I'm being old, too old school, but I have, I don't get it. You, you, you can say, I get it. I don't get it. I look, I think, I, I think Caleb Williams is a really special player. I think Caleb Williams has a bunch of questions about, uh, his makeup as the face of a franchise. And I think that none of that helps when he decides to enter the league without an agent and then is making unprecedented decisions uh, at the combine without even the like advisement of an agent telling him you should do. like, maybe I could say, all right, well, he hired Todd France at CAA and Todd France must know something or feels like, Hey, let's do this. Let's drive this hard. Life. This is just yeah. Caleb Williams doing these things on his own. And I think that that's the concerning am, am aspect I, for am that I being unrealistic again. I'm just trying no. to, my experience, like when I ran the draft in Philadelphia, and 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 I and if I wouldn't have had, if I wouldn't have had the medical information on Jeremiah Trotter Senior, yeah, you know, what if he decided he didn't want to, he didn't want to take the medical, you know, right. if I wouldn't have had that. I don't think I could draft the player because I knew going in that he had a history of knee problems, you know. So and I mean, I'll give you an example: Wilson, the kid from North Carolina State, the linebacker. Peyton Wilson, yep. Peyton Wilson, I think, is one of the best linebackers in the draft. He had a he has a lot of medical questions. A yeah. lot of medical and there's probably going to be some stuff coming out about him. Okay. So keep an eye on that. But that's kind of the concerns I have. You know, the guy's been clean for two years, but there's going to probably be something that we learn. That if you if he didn't go through all the physical part, I would not be able to draft him. But if Caleb if Caleb Williams goes to to the Bears, 30 visits, does the physical and then cancels all the other 30 visits that he's on, you know who the first pick of the draft's going to be. Yeah. But yeah, it tells you every it tells I I just would worry if I was one of those teams that wanted to trade for him now, is he going to even is he going to come visit me to get a physical? I can't yeah. even I can't even I can't even plan for that. So anyway, that's my soapbox stood right up on top of it, both <laughs> feet. I, I think the guy's a hell of a player. I think he's a unique personality. I think we're now in an era where the players run the game. You know, much yeah. like we're saying in the NBA, players run the game. We I had a scout tell me this. 
He goes, you know, these guys at LSU, they ain't working out and all that. I'm just like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get in our car and we're going to drive to Baton Rouge. And we're going to work out all these guys because that's what we do every year. And he goes, you know, you're right. You're right. We're really at the, we're at the mercy of these players. And you know what? That's our job. That's our job to be. But you just, if you could have knocked out some of that Caleb Williams stuff as a group, as a, as a, as a league, you'd probably, probably be better off going forward. So uh, outside of that, I mean, the Caleb Williams thing is is big there. I mean, there were a lot of real interesting particulars with this one. Jaden Daniels yeah. not working out, not even weighing in, um, you know, just a lot of different things coming out about this class with quarterbacks. Man, specifically. That's a slight dude. <laughs> what, what is the, what, what stood out to you about the, let's take the guys who did test and the yeah. guys who did participate University of Texas, congratulations. Was, was there anybody that stood out to you that said, wow, okay, that that to me is not just – like, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples here when we talk about trusting the testing or, or, or cross-referencing the testing to the take. Uh, good and bad example of it. Bad example, um, Tease Tabor, when he was coming out of Florida a number of years ago. Yes. He didn't look like a 4-6 corner on tape. Nope. And no. when he ran 4-6, it went, uh, uh-oh, okay, yes. hold on. Yes. And you you wanted to trust the tape, and a lot of people did. I I had him as a first round corner, and then you saw how quickly he flamed out. That was yeah. one where it's like, man, maybe should have paid a little bit more attention to that number. Then you have some other ones where it's like, you know, TJ Watt was asked to be a push pull guy at Wisconsin, yeah. so you didn't necessarily see some of the athleticism. But then he goes to the combine and does things athletically that you're like, that didn't look like that was going on at tape on tape. You didn't see yeah. that kind of athleticism on tape, yeah. and so it makes you kind of go back and look, and that ends up playing. He is that kind of an athlete. That is the kind of player that he could become. So so who, for you, stood out that made you go, man, that didn't match up either in a good or bad way. That didn't match up necessarily what I saw on tape. Was there a guy who stood out for you in terms of his testing numbers? Yeah, and I, I think to me it, it was that when you watch, and I and I really, I mean, I love, I love studying these guys, Bobby. You know that I absolutely yeah. – this is what, you know, and, and I, I just appreciate the opportunity that we get to do this. But Kalen King from Penn State was that guy for me. And I know people out there are going, well, who's Kalen King? He's, he's, a, he's a, I think this kid's a really good football player. The problem is Kalen King ran, ran in the 4-6 as a corner. And that's like death is what that is. But when you watch Kalen King play, he doesn't play like a four, six guy. Right. Now you'll see him. He'll grab occasionally. He'll pull, he'll hook. He plays the ball down the field. He's, he's, you know, he's one of those guys that can track it. He can anticipate the fly of the ball. He puts himself in position. I thought the speed was good enough to allow him to carry or to drive on the ball when he had to, but that was a guy, his, you know, his footwork I put in my notes and agility allow for the smooth transitions. Four one six in the twenty shuttle lateral agility test, you know, and you see that. So high football IQ, some lateral agility on the tape. He just does it. Now I could go to Happy Valley. I could go to State College and at Penn State, and if I really like this kid and mm-hmm. I time him. I could get him at 38 yards if you want me to. <laughs> I can. I could stand there and hit my clock early, and I could get a good time for this guy. But Kalen King is a kid that it, it plays really, really, I think, at a very high level. He just doesn't run a really great 40. And, you know, I'm there's 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 that, you know, you, you just don't want to back off. You know, when I when I see a kid, Keon Coleman from Florida State. Another guy, you know, you watch him play. This guy was a basketball player at Michigan State. He was a football player. He's he's got that elite size, frame, ability. He doesn't look like a four six guy when you know you watch him return punts. Which which it was interesting. He's a four six guy in the forty. Yeah, and then when he did the gauntlet. He went through the gauntlet faster than any of the other receivers. So See, he's that's a little what bit I'm saying. And, and and one example, the guy who did that last year was Puka Nakua. Yeah. And Nakua was a four, five, seven guy who then ran through the gauntlet fast. So right. yeah, you're right. You, right. you got to see these as different things. Yeah. I mean, I I'll tell you what, uh, the kid Roman Wilson 
from Michigan. Michigan. Okay, 5'11", 185. Roman Wilson, to me, I was thinking Roman Wilson was a 5'8 guy. I was thinking he is a (laughs) short little guy. And, you know, you watch him and, you know, he, he, he really came on the scene in his senior year. And he was a major factor of, of Michigan winning the national championships. Huge plays in the Alabama game. But, you know, you, you when you watch tape, you were expecting a much smaller guy. And then you watch him going through those drills and you're like going, wait a minute, he's a little bit bigger guy and he's got really good hands. So, uh, you know, it's those are the kinds of things that uh, – and I, and I have to share something too with you uh, – <laughs> My son Bennett is, you know, as you know, is a, is a sophomore at the University of Texas. And uh, he, he, he gave me my first line when I wrote my Xavier Worthy report, uh, you know, well, well before the combine. And I, my first line was, I'll steal a line from my son Bennett when he described hmm. Worthy's game as, Dad, he's Calvin Ridley plus route runner with breakout speed. Hmm. That was my son's scouting report he nailed it on Xavier Worthy but Bennett goes to all the games and he and he yeah. he just lives it but that's what I'm saying you know fluid elite explosiveness speed see those are the kinds of things when you see a guy run 4-2 you're going okay this translates into what the player now he's a slight built guy I mean as a slight built man yeah but when it comes to tracking it getting it cross the middle, go in the air. Those are all things that that the workout translates into how the player plays. So yeah. you have some really good and you have some really poor that you got to kind of navigate. Yeah, a couple uh, quick notes before we go to the, the mailbag. A couple just different things for me coming out of this that I, I thought were interesting. And we'll be talking about these on, on the draft show this week too, I'm sure. Um, tough weigh-in for a uh, couple of – slightly built players nate wiggins the corner from clemson yeah uh, that was a, that and that's a first troy, round troy franklin me. troy franklin the receiver at oregon yeah. both of them came in they were considered slight built players before they both came in 10 to 12 pounds lower than their listed yeah. weight yeah. and now now you're looking at okay uh the same questions you asked about nate or you asked about emmanuel forbes you're probably asking forbes. about nate wiggins um you know a little bit of a callback here maybe some of the same questions you asked about um uh, D.D. Westbrook, you're asking about Troy Franklin now. Um, and so those are some of the things that came out of there. Audric Estime running a 4-7-1. I don't know that I saw 4-7 on the Notre Dame tape for him. Uh, you know what, he, Bobby? That's, to me, I that was one of those ones that I, I kind of, I felt like that there was more power there than there was elusiveness there. Sure, when but I, you're running a 4-7, Brian. Audrey Estime should at least run in the four sixes. <laughs> I, I just don't. I mean, to me, everything that you really watch with him is a head of steam guy, mm-hmm. you know, and knows for the goal line. And I, I said this. This was one of my lines in my report. I did him probably two weeks ago. Speed is good enough, but I wouldn't say that he has great long speed. But you will see him finish some runs. And I, I, I just didn't see a really fast guy. Like I thought he was a little bit more straight line. And then there were some other times where he did have a little la- a, a lateral agility to his thing. But he runs with short, choppy steps. And I didn't see a lot of quickness with him. So that's kind of where... I definitely, did, I definitely didn't think he'd test near the top. But man, 4-7, that's... You get some offensive linemen that'll run 4-7 almost on you. And, oh, no. and, yeah. and that, that last one for me that was a little, a little puzzling, I guess, was and the one I the one that I'm definitely gonna have to go back and watch now because I feel like the ta- the testing didn't match up with what I saw at all is Cooper Beebe, the guard from Kansas State who tested like a better movement athlete than I thought I saw on tape, yeah. and then you 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 sit there and go, man, he's a power guy. He comes in with short arms and he does 20 reps on the bench, which was one of the lower numbers for guard. Yeah. So so yeah. low power in his testing and much better athleticism than I was expecting. So Cooper Beebe really threw me off because that was kind of the complete opposite of what I had seen him do on tape. Yeah, there's there's times where he's had when he had some trouble dealing with some quicker opponents. And 
you know, but you didn't see him on the ground or stumbling around. So you thought about the athletic ability. Uh, the thing with the the bench, and that always kills me because Aisha Morris and I were talking about this. She goes, what do you look at at the bench and how, and I was saying sometimes some really long armed guys struggle with the bench. Which he's because not. Because you have to drive the bar. And, yeah. you know, and they're watching to a certain level where the bar is going every time. You know, mm-hmm. they're counting and they'll say, you know, sometimes it's 20 good reps, four bad ones. You know, you think 24, yeah. they, they only give them 20 because they didn't go past the threshold of, of you know, the lifting there. But the thing with, with Cooper BB is that to me, I, I just kind of felt like that he was an old school guy. And I kind of understood about the mauling ability of him, the size, the mass. You know, but you, you, there are some things I thought he would struggle on the second level, but he doesn't, man. He really doesn't struggle on the second level. So he was asked to pull a lot. You watch him play, he was asked to pull a lot. He did it pretty well. So I know Zach Wolchuk really, really liked yeah, him a lot. Big fan of his. Big fan of his. And, but, well, and the I, mental processing is really good. There's a lot to really like about yeah. him. I was just, I was floored that with 31 and a half inch arms or whatever yeah, he had. He did, yeah. He did See, 20 on careful. the bench. Yeah. You got to be careful of that too. Because, but his shuttle and his three cone were good. Yeah, and he, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's interesting. And more, more fun stuff to dive into throughout this week. You're listening to the Love the Stars, <laughs> the Love the Stars and Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time to dive into our Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag. A lot of questions uh, this week. In fact, this is this is the big one, consistently from everybody. Uh, they're, they're wanting to know about, and we'll continue the draft theme, with the Tyron Smith discussion. And if the Cowboys are serious about playing Tyler Smith at left guard, there's about 20 people that want to know what tackles are you looking at at pick 24? If you if you draft an interior offense, let's say you get a center to replace Biotish at 24, yeah. what tackles could you potentially be looking at in the second or third round? What, what are some names in general? Just kind of give us an overview of this tackle class, Brian, which everybody has been talking about recently is a really rare class. It's a good class to need yeah. a tackle. Yeah, it is. It is a very good class to uh, for the offensive tackles. And, you know, it's it's funny because we were talking about BB and there seems to be more. I was talking to a scout today uh, about about uh, the Alabama kid, uh, Latham. Is, yep, uh, J.C. Latham. J.C. Yep. Latham. And I asked him, I said, do you feel that Latham could be a left tackle in the league? And he said, man, I don't think so. I think he's a right tackle only, but he, I think he would be a killer guard. You know, so there may be some of these guys, when you look at these offensive tackles, I, I kind of feel like down the line guy, uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with Morgan. And then we'll see what happens with the Washington. Uh, yeah, let's let, let, let me throw some of those. I'm, I'm going to yeah. throw some guys at you real quick, Brian. You just tell okay. me if you'd play him at tackle or guard, okay? Right. Uh, first one, uh, Talise Fuaga from Oregon State. I would play him at tackle. Jordan Morgan from Arizona. I would play him at left tackle. Okay. Uh, Troy uh, Fatanu. Fatanu, I think I would consider playing him at guard, but I think he, I think he's – I think he's got the skill to still stay at a tackle spot. I love his toughness, though. See, if I had to rate, I had to rate um, Alt was my number one guy. And then there's Fuaga, the Oregon State kid, right? Yep, yep. And then I have the Penn State uh, kid after that. Olu Fashnu. Fashnu, then Guyton, and then Latham. Those, I have five first-round grades on those guys. Five first round grades. So you have Guy, then, you have Guyton above Mims. A Mary, Guyton that's above a, that's Mims. a Marius Mims from Georgia. See, and that's the thing about it, man. I the thing with Mims. There's the such little Mims, tape on Mims. Such little tape. Such little tape. And that's that is my problem when I when I look at these tackles. Now, I have the BYU kid in there. I have Morgan. That's Kingsley Suamata'ia from BYU. Uh, there you go. I appreciate you coming up with all these <laughs> names. But yeah, I've got I've got like nine guys in the first two rounds. 
And then Fisher from Notre Dame, Foster from uh, Missouri is another kid I watched. Our Yale kid, how would you say the Yale kid's last name? Uh, the, the Yale kid, that would be uh, Karan uh, um, Omega G. Omega G. Karan okay. Omega G. Omega G. Okay. I have Fisher, Foster, Omega G, and Paul in the third round. So that's how far I've gotten with the tackles so far. Now, you know, I, I, the, a, a guy I really liked tonight that I watched was on the opposite side of Fashnu. I'm curious, where did you grade Caden Wallace, the right tackle over there? Yeah, Caden Wallace I have in the fourth is where I got I think him. Wallace, if you look at just – if you're going to ask me, like, I mean, Fashnu's clearly got massive right. upside. If you're right. asking me today – who is a more reliable, ready to step in and take NFL snaps player? It might be Wallace. Yeah. Like Wallace is a forty he start. No, he looks NFL ready. He sure forty does. career starts at yeah. right tackle in the Big Ten, and a guy who is really sound with the technique, really advanced. Yeah. I think. And now there's a limitation to, you know, what he's able to do. Yeah. I think in terms. Of, I mean, athletically, he didn't test bad, and I think that he he's got some some intriguing athletic ability, but you know, yeah. I think that you watch when he's some of these faster edge rushers are going to give him some problems at yeah. times. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, that quickness, uh, you, you know, can, can eat him up a little bit, but I think in terms of technique and just being solid, like I would, if I drafted Caden Wallace and then my starting tackle got hurt, uh, you know, right before week one and I had to plug and play rookie K balls uh, at tackle. I would feel better about him than some of the guys I have graded above him just for next year, because I think he's yeah. somebody who is a, a pretty steady option. But if you're looking for a, you know, I, I put Wallace in the third, if you're looking for a yeah. third, fourth round option in a really deep class, that might be a name to know. You, you mentioned sure. Fisher from Notre Dame. Yeah. That's a guy who more high ceiling, more like, hey, there, there's some traits yeah. here that you're going to bank on. It's not all put together yet, but Fisher can be that guy for you. And so, I think, I think Foster, at, I think Foster at Missouri is a good player, a little yeah. bit of a lighter guy. But I, I think you know when you start to talk about those third round offensive tackles, he he fits right in that slot for me. Now, when we look at the interior of the offensive line, because that was another question we got a lot of. These were very heavy questions this week on tackle and center. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the interior of the offensive line. How do you grade those guys out in the top three rounds? Who all have you seen at center specifically that you, yeah, you would Johnson be interested Powers in? Jackson Powers is my only first round center. Jackson Powers I, Johnson, that's from uh, yeah, Oregon. Yeah, I have. I actually have Frazier over Barton in the second, and okay. I'll tell you why. I've seen Frazier play center. I haven't seen Barton play center. You know that's now we talk about ceilings and floors and all those things. Maybe Barton's a better player. I, I know one thing. You watch Frazier against Texas, the West Virginia center. He holds his own inside against those guys. When we're talking about Murphy and Sweat and those guys, he was able to hold his own inside. So I kind of like him. I think that I don't think you could go wrong with Frazier or Barton in that second round. Van Pram, the Georgia center. I got in the third round is where I have. So the the centers that I've seen so far. Now, I need to get on. Uh, you need to watch the Penn State kid. Penn State. I need to watch Arkansas. Uh, who who is the one that tested really really well? Uh, the with the Italian last name that uh, the center that tested really 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 well. Uh, oh, um, yeah. Let me pull up the combine numbers. Yeah, well, pull it up if you could. But I know Aisha Morrison was telling me. Hey, you got to watch. You got to watch these centers. She's she went into it a little bit further than me. Like I say, I've got the four guys that I've done. Who who is the guy? Who's I'm the guy pulling that? it up right now. But uh, here, while I pull that up for you, I am going to ask you really quickly if I could throw you out the option, Brian. Of let's say um, you have Fuaga in the first round, right? You said uh, yes. I have him as my number two. Number two, offensive tackle. Okay, if I could give you Fuaga and let's say Frazier in the third. Or yeah. I could give you Powers Johnson in the first and Paul in the third. See, I mean, that's the problem I have. Which would I, you rather have? I, Jeez, you need the center so damn bad. 
Wisconsin yeah. center, by the way, uh, Bordellini. Bordellini, thank you very much. They, they love their Wisconsin me. centers here. They, uh, yeah, there you go. I need to I need to watch the what, the Arkansas center and the Wisconsin center. Uh, two I have to two have to get on here, but uh, that's a tough one because I love Johnson's power, but I think, damn. I, I mean, I've got a second-round grade on Frazier. If you gave me Fuaga and Frazier, I think I would be pretty good to go. I think I think that would be my combination. Because Johnson Powers, I have a one, and then Paul, I have a third. On the flip side of that, Fuaga, I have a one. Frazier, I have a two. So I think I would take the combination of Fuaga and Frazier and, and, and go, go with the battle with that. And there you go. That's just some of what you have to look forward to over the next several weeks as we do, continue do see, to dive into it, the draft. Do you have it that way? Do you like Paul more I, than me? Do I, do I, no, I got yeah, slightly. I got Paul as my last second round grade tackle okay. right now. I got the BYU kid as my last second Which round. Which I actually have I don't have a center in the first round. I have Powers Johnson as a second. So oh, I would right. okay. Cool. Yeah, I would I would probably take Fuaga and Frazier. Yeah, I think I would. that Because Paul and Powers walk, Johnson are both second-round guys. I think I got 22 names in the first round. I'm looking at my board as we speak here. Uh, that's four. That's five. That's I have 10, 18. 11, 14, 17, 18, 21, 22. 22 names in the first round. So I have, I have 18, and five of them are tackles. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I'm so it's it's an interesting group, and uh, we'll have a lot more to say about it over the coming weeks uh, as we cover this Cowboys team. And uh, they're about to enter free agency. We're about to get a lot of answers in <laughs> regards to what they're planning and yeah. uh, then hopefully get some clarity on on this draft and some of the visitors that they bring in there. So we'll be bringing that to you. Uh, remember to check out the draft show, uh, and then you can hear Brian on more of these topics and also check out 105 to the Fan as well. For Brian Broaddus, I'm Bobby Belt. We will talk to you guys again later. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.